Hello and welcome to Agency Automators. Today is a really exciting day because I get to spend it with Jordan. What's up, Jordan? Yo, yo, yo. What's going on? You look like you're in full on pandemic mode. <laughs> Maybe. I'm really I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to a year out and when we get to look back and laugh at this time and hopefully it's a blip, right? Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, because I'm I'm starting to get cabin fever here. So are I'll you have really? to take a dog out for a walk sooner or later. Oh my goodness. Well, for me, I've been spending my time walking Shadow, who you can see rolling around on the bed and snorting. And I've also been spending my time learning all about how to build agency data pipelines. I've been hearing about these things for years. I've been talking with uh, the founder of Coding is for Losers named David Krevit about his really cool course, which you can sign up for and take. It's not inexpensive um, at all, but there's an amazing amount of information. Why are we talking about this? Um, it's really, it's really an easy thing. Like uh, you and I have been struggling with reporting for a long time, right? Yep. What do you think is exciting about building a day agent, a, a blah, an agency data pipeline? So, so funny enough for, for me, um, I think it took a little longer for me to quote unquote, see the light than, than with you, Noah when it came to, uh, to, to data pipelines and, and all that. But um, now that I've finally seen it, um, I know I'm using my pipeline. I'm seeing the real benefit of being able to run statistical analyses on large quantities of data with ease. Because before I'd be piping everything into Google Sheets through Supermetrics, and that would take, it would take forever to pull the data and then forever to actually crunch it. Yeah. That totally sounds familiar to me too. Um, I felt like um, we were building these really neat uh, pipelines inside Google Sheets. And I was running into issues where if you look at um, the aggregated page where it's like aggregating stuff, like mm -hmm. this is scary having to jump in and deal with having to dump jump in and deal with with formulas inside google sheets can be really mm -hmm. scary um, especially when you're dealing with a scenario where there are formulas and more formulas and more formulas and super easy for people to break like in this one example we had three different sheets where there was aggregations happening at each different level and this was really easy for people to break, right? So that was the biggest thing mm -hmm. for me. Um, and it wasn't just formulas. The other pieces of it that, that were really kind of scary were having to deal with, um, hey, Zach, welcome aboard. Um, feel free to turn your mic on, turn it off, whatever. We're doing a live agency automators hangout today. So this is new for us. Zach, can you hear us? You'll figure out your mic. That's cool. Um, so I'm going to mute. Someone's got a weird echo. There we go. Okay, cool. Um, what, what also really drives me nuts about dealing with sheets is the speed issue too. Like uh, sheets are super slow as a data source. And also it's really easy to mess up data types inside sheet cells and you can't even tell if the data type is wrong and oh yes get all these like crazy errors in data studio when you're trying to visualize your data on the tail end of this whole process and um it was just it just drove me nuts and i knew that it was an issue of how we were using multiple tabs and multiple layers of formulas on top of formulas and that's why things were breaking. And when I finally came to realize that you could replace all of those different formulas with one crazy SQL statement, and even this at 180 lines is like not that much 
and compared to all of those different formulas that we had to build to get that same reporting solution with sheets. And so do you think we should define, I mean, it makes sense to me like we should define what a data pipeline is because some people might not actually know. Yeah. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll let, I'll let you uh, give out that formal definition though, because I, I wouldn't know where to start. Okay. So it's totally informal. So, so I would say a data, a data pipeline is gathering data in a meaningful way that answers specific analytical questions that help you make smart decisions for your organization. Right. Or it's gathering, analyzing and visualizing data in a way that helps you solve business or organizational challenges. You know, like for one agency, that question might have been, what is the true cost of a lead? Or which marketing channel has the best or the, or the most ROI and which one has the lowest cost per lead? Those would be examples of questions that we try to answer after we've built our, our data agency pipeline. And what no, would, it, I, I, w I would argue the inverse. Okay. Um, I would argue you should start with the question first. Yes. And then build the pipeline around that. Yep. And David would say the same thing. And that's the guidance that he offers in his course. Totally agree. In our specific case, we had a report. We had a finished product that we were starting with. And then we worked backwards. And for those in this meeting, we're gonna be looking at all, pretty much all the steps. I'm not gonna go into an enormous amount of detail on any of them. The point of this is just to open up your mind and to show you sort of the, the large big picture steps of how to get it going. This is not gonna be a 17 hour course that costs you $4,000 to attend. It's, it's more of a, high level introduction. So, um, and I've got a cool little document that I'm happy, happy to share with everybody. This is sort of the process that I came up with. Oh boy, data visualization royalty has entered the room. Hey Lee. Uh, so when you, there he is. Here's the man, the myth, the legend, Lee Hurst the one we all love, look up to. Uh, so when you're coming up with a reporting solution, the first thing you have to figure out is your grain. Like how granular do you need to be? Is it monthly? Is it weekly? Is it daily? Um, again, you have to come up with the questions that, that you're trying to answer. L list out all the questions. An example could be, what's the cost per lead for each of your channels? You then map out all your different data sources. Are we getting data from Facebook? Are we getting it from MailChimp? Are we getting it from Google Analytics? Are we getting it from Google Search Console? Um, you then can um, go into even more grain, excuse the, the term, and list out all the metrics and dimensions that you're gonna need for each of the different data sources, right? Does that make sense? And then we're still using a sheets based solution in the following way. We're going to use Supermetrics Pro for sheets and we're going to pull all of that data into a Google sheet. We're going to use that Google sheet as our data source to pull data into BigQuery and we're going to aggregate it and analyze it using a tool called DBT. And then we're gonna visualize the data on the tail end with a tool called Google, uh, blah, 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 uh, called Google Data Studio. Um, we're gonna look at BigQuery, how we set up our projects. We're gonna look at how we build our external tables. We're gonna look at building out the DBT product uh, project. I'll go into some high level stuff about how different models are built inside DBT. And then I'm also gonna show you how the visualization works with a BigQuery based solution. And then I'll try and open up another one that's pulling data either out of native connectors 
or um, f from Google Sheets so you can see the speed difference because it's really, it's just radically faster to, to visualize from BigQuery. Does that sound good as a high level? Make sense? Sounds good to me. Okay, sweet. So <clears throat> the way Supermetrics works for Sheets, if anyone um, hasn't used it before, it's an add-on that's available. And I'm just going to switch users so that I'm using the uh, proper user for my Supermetrics add-on. The way that it works is you pull in the, the data into the sheet. Um, if you've never used it before, it's really easy to um, break things with Supermetrics if you're not paying a, a lot of attention. So you go add-ons, Supermetrics, launch sidebar. You then have to choose, um, you choose the, the data source that you want to use to pull from. You pick the dates. You pick your metrics. You also have to figure out how you want to split the data up. And that um, will, will determine how, uh, how the columns and which columns the data goes into. Um, you're also going to combine new results with old, format for Google Data Studio, and get data to table. And then it, what it'll do is it'll pull in all the metrics directly from that data source. And assuming that that data looks good, you can then set up a scheduling of that data so that routinely the data gets pulled from Supermetrics into the sheet. So if we're doing it for um, our grain or how often we want to report is monthly, we could run this every month to pull in the last month's data, or you could even pull in the last three months worth of data. And Jordan and I haven't tested this, but I think if you, check combine new results with old it will update older data that um that since the last run if supermetrics has new stuff i think it's going to overwrite the data we have to test that um, that's how we get our data into the google sheet as our data source we're going to shift gears and we're going to look at how to um use um this to build out our external tables. And the reason that we're doing this is that um, each of these external tables is really like a, a placeholder that DBT is going to use to then query to build our final tables. Noah, or, could, you, yeah. could you elaborate on what that placeholder table is versus a normal table within BigQuery? Is this, that's new to me as well. Totally, because I want I want this to be clear for everybody. And I this is like where I go a hat tip to Nico Brooks of Two Octobers because he introduced me to this concept. Um, this is how you do it, um, and this is how they're different, right? When you look at a standard table, one that's inside BigQuery and that holds data, what you're going to see is that it's going to say schema details and preview which is gonna show you that you actually have data in it. When you create an external table in BigQuery, you're gonna see that it has schema or structure and that there are details about it, but there's no actual data in it. Um, this is how you do it. It's really quite simple to set it up. You click on the data set, which is the parent for that, and then you do create table, and you go, our source is going to be from Drive. I'm just going to move this out of the way. We're going to use this report. And we go, you get your share link from here. And you paste it back into BigQuery right there. You change your file format to Google Sheet. And let's say we want to pull in Facebook data. We're just going to go Facebook for the name of the tab. 
this is one of those gotchas, by the way, Jordan, I forgot to tell you this earlier. So notice I'm defining the sheet range as Facebook. And what it's going to do then is look across these tab names on the bottom and it's gonna pull in the data from the Facebook tab. If you do not define the sheet range here, it's going to pull from whichever tab is the first tab on the left. That is such a gotcha and it took me a while to figure that out. But anyway, so you name your range. You do auto detect schema. You skip one row. So, so, so the, the, the schema auto detection will essentially take the data type of each column in the G sheet and apply it to BigQuery? Correct. Okay. Gotcha, number three. There are times when you do this build and the schema is messed up. And the way that you'll know that it's messed up is it's going to say, um, it'll show you the rows of all the field names and it'll say like string zero, string one, string two. Like it won't properly do it. And I found that there are times where I have to define this once or twice. This gotcha, which was um, gotcha number two, is really critical. If you, if you don't add that header row to skip, it won't pull in the column title. It'll pull in the first row of data as a piece of data, and it'll name all of the columns something random oh. and not meaningful, which is super annoying and messed up, right? So, um, so now I should be able to hit, oh, I have to name the table. So I'd go Facebook, two, just for fun, create table. It now gives me an option down here to go to table and I can see all my field names. So, so the way this works is that the data never really lives in BigQuery. It's just a reference to Google Sheets and it lives within Google Sheets, that data, right? Yes. So you don't have to pay for the BigQuery storage cost for this. Right. Nor the, um, so it's real simple that way. And we're not worried, the downside, like if you wanted to be super simplistic, you could use these as the source files mm -hmm. to then have my, um, to, to have my DBT query off of to build all the data. But I didn't want to do that because I felt like, um, I'm not sure why, but uh, let's go through that and I'll, I'll explain what I mean as, as we go. So okay. for each of your different marketing channels, you build an external table following the process that I just showed you. If you build one and it's all messed up, like it says string zero, string one, string two, just delete the table and do that little process I showed you over again. Does that make sense? Okay. And then you do that for all your marketing channels and all your other relevant pieces of information, which so might include, yeah. Quick, quick question. Uh, I noticed, so that's where you've got your uh, underscore in. That's what you're yeah. using. Yeah, that was just my naming convention. Just double checking. Okay. Yeah. Just the naming convention. It doesn't, it. you know, it's not, doesn't. No, that's matter. fine. Um, and then, so you can see your types too. Sometimes they're messed up. And if they are messed up, then you might need to build your schema by manually, which is not a big deal. Um, to do that, and the reason I'm showing you this is that um, you can build it manually. So you can say, you know, like field name A, whatever it was, cost. And let's say you built it once manually. And no matter what you did, the data type was um, integer, but it needed to be float for example. Mm -hmm. um, and just to take a step back, there are different data types for what's going into a database. There's a string, which is like words, letters, text. There are integers, which are whole numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Floats are anything where there's a decimal point. So let's think of like conversion rate, anything with percentages. Does that all make sense so far? And then, um, so you could build the schema manually is what I was trying to show you. So these are the different data types. For our purposes, what I found 
as I was building stuff, I really leaned a lot. If I had to do it manually, it was almost all string, integer, float, and maybe date or timestamp. You know, I really no wasn't. with 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 these external tables, you're able to set it set the schema manually as well. Yes, that's that's what this that's what this does right here. Okay, and that yeah, would be curious because right now you have like the uh, empty table as uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, table. Right. yeah, we can go yeah, drive. Check. Google now. If I click this schema, you know, auto detect that goes away. Right. But you can also do it manually. But again, this is the gotcha. This drove me freaking bonkers. I probably wasted five hours of my time. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saving you those five Thank hours. You. Appreciate <laughs> like, it. It was like so maddening. Like why? I don't remember exactly what the output was, but it was totally messed up. It yeah. kept seeing it as string one, string two, string three. That was the problem was that it wasn't able right. to find the data type. Well, because your headers are all strings. Yeah. So exactly. it says, oh, there's, there's strings. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it was just crazy annoying. So uh, Noah, can, uh, you, can you override? Uh, I guess you can up there, right? Where you got the names there, you could override one of those uh, uh, types. Yeah. You get string, string, string. You could, okay. So you could just override it there, even though you did it automatically. So yeah. here's the thing in BigQuery you can't edit after the fact, it's locked. And you can't oh. delete field names from a, one that's already live. This is like us so we're the wizard to build one. Human. It's kind of crazy. Okay, so you also are gonna add other, other, um, other tables the same way, which might be like your client list of all your different clients in the agency. Mm -hmm. You might have another one, which might be management fees that are associated with each client. So you'll know what each one is paying. And it, and, it could also be like in February, tw uh, February 2020, client A paid us $6,000 a month. In March, they paid us Y. And that'll help us get to that cost per lead, right? Which might change as their engagement, as their management fees change over time as well. So, um, so we get all of our, our tables built out. And this is where we're going to shift gears into DBT. Does anyone have questions for what we've covered so far? Did I give enough detail on the Google Sheets part and the Supermetrics part? I'm, I am. Hey, no, this is Zach. Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, we can, Zach. Cool. Yeah, sorry, I was having problems with my audio earlier. Um, and you might have covered this. I got on a few minutes late. But when you're setting up these big query tables, yes. once you set up that connection once, will they – dynamically populate with the Google Sheets data if that has a trigger set up to, you know, repopulate once every two weeks? So the way it's going to make a ton of sense to you after I show you, but, but think of these as a reference pointing to a sheet. Mm -hmm. And then we're querying that reference in DBT later on. And so on Got day it. one, if I have 12 rows of data and I query it in DBT, it's going to pull in those 12 rows. Day two, Supermetrics pulls in more data and I have 2,000 rows. When I query it again in DBT, it's going to, it's going to, I think it drops that first table, rebuilds it on the fly with all of that new data in aggregate. Mm -hmm. The way that I'm doing it, that's how it works. I'm not positive yet if from a budget or performance perspective, that's the smartest way to do it. But I also think that it's a good enough proof of concept to share. Cool. But, Thank you. Yeah. Did that make sense to you? Yeah, definitely. It does. Cool. So now we're going to look at DBT a little bit. What is it? Why is it cool? All that kind of stuff. You can use this tool in a couple different ways. If you're comfortable working um, from the command line, and if you're comfortable hooking up your computer to GitHub directly on your own computer, and you're comfortable working in your own IDE or text editor, and you have all kinds of stuff that you like to use in your text editor, then you can use it from the command line. So you have to install it on your computer, et cetera. 
You can also use something called DBT Cloud. I personally think DBT Cloud is the bomb. And the reason why it's so cool is that you can set up cron jobs to get it to run like what you asked about, Zach, which is to, you know, on month one, pull in data, month two, pull in data, month three. And I'll show mm -hmm. you how those automation jobs work in just a couple minutes. But, so Noah, it's, yeah. it's kind of like a, a programming layer on top of BigQuery then. Correct. And okay. to get more granular or more detailed, DBT is built on Python and it generates all of the SQL queries for you from things called models. And as you spin up a data pipeline, you can build a master one and you can store it inside your own GitHub as a private GitHub repo. And then when you build a new project, you just import that GitHub repo and you can change some config lines in what's called your project YAML file to match your client name here. Let's say I'm changing it to Acme, right? Acme. I would then change this to Acme. I could then change my client name to Acme because this is just a variable declaration area. So that in other, in different places down the road, what you're going to see is that I have these references, which will look familiar based on whatever programming languages you've used in the past for where these different things will come in. And I'll show you an example of that. Okay. So all of the work that I'm going to be doing are inside things called models. And the way that DBT is conceptually organized is that you're, we're querying those um, external database tables from BigQuery using these things called models. And this should look pretty simple to you guys. This is, um, I'm configuring this specific model so that when it's built, it's being built as a table. You can also have them build as a view. You can have them build as some other different types of models, but we're just going to use a table. And this should look really simple for anyone who's done SQL before. Select all from, and this is where it gets really neat. Do you remember how I had in this, I had my client name, my clean client, and my profile? Well, you'll see here that I'm pulling in the variable client. And then let's say I'm building project number two. So instead of Cam Solar, I'm doing Acme. When it goes to build that data set inside BigQuery, instead of putting it in Cam Solar, it's going to put all of those brand new tables into Acme. How cool is that? Is that pretty so sweet? Huh. So it's like create once, duplicate forever type thing. And all yeah. you need to do is change, it, change the YAML file? Yes. Now, you asked about goals. Well, how did you solve the whole form field and client A is goal one and form field and client B is goal two? Um, you can solve that by doing SQL queries here or creating what are called models, or you can do that at the visualization layer. I think it's easier to do it at the data studio level. Like let's say we know that our form fills so happen to be goal one, four, and seven. It's pretty easy in data studio to just create a, create a field that is, you know, goal four completions and goal seven, goal 11 or whatever. Okay, so the, this is kind of like a, um, um, the company that built DBT is called Fishtown Analytics, and they're in, in Philadelphia. And they have um, their philosophy about how to do this is that basically you have source tables, right? Those are my external tables in BigQuery. I'm then going to query them with my models, which are going to um, build those real tables in BigQuery. And then I can query these tables 
with like my big analysis table. Do you remember I showed you that huge, that huge SQL query in my text editor? Well, this is where, um, that's where this query comes in and is asking queries of all my other tables. I suppose I could have had these all refer to, I could have had them refer straight to these um, external tables, but I feel like one of the major benefits of DBT that I'm not using enough at all is the ability to normalize and prep and clean your data on the input. So it gives me an opportunity to like normalize date and time zones. It gives me an opportunity to deal with null values <clears throat> or blank values. And so that's why I think that it makes sense to do it this way. Before I was like, oh, I don't know, maybe I should have done it. But really, I think it makes sense to do it this way. So. Um, no, no, a quick question. So yeah. um, you, these queries, so like this Facebook one right here, it's yeah. querying the uh, external table yeah. to create an actual internal uh, BigQuery table, correct? Yes. And then with that huge, I think it's reporting underscore final dot SQL statement, yep. that yep. file, that's what queries all of the ones that you've created from the external ones, right? Wait, ask that second piece again. So, so with all the tables that you created from the external tables, yes. that is what you're querying from the reporting final. One. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And the beauty of it is that when you start to query s models with other models, you can replace these super ugly left joins with references that look like, that look like, um, where's my Facebook one? Where's my Facebook query? Which look like this. So instead of having that, super ugly left join, I could have just have it reference another model, which is really brilliant, I think, because it'll help you keep everything modular and easy and simple. But anyway, so this is, you know, yes. Uh, just a quick question. So I get you're uh, basically creating a new table here. Yeah. Uh, and you're materializing it. Is it yeah. going to be called Facebook? Because I don't see any, uh, uh, Great question. Table there. So the thing that's cool about this is that whatever you name these models, okay, that's what they call them. That's their nomenclature. Gotcha. Whatever you name the model is what's going to be output as a table. Okay, just double checking. Isn't that that's cool? I, have, I kind of figured that. I'm like, yeah, let me just double check that. Yeah. So, um, all right. So this is the Facebook one. Then I have Facebook trends and this one is so that I can get reach because I couldn't just do that one super metrics poll and have reach in the same page because it'll double count users who might look at campaign A and campaign B. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Lee, you're not, you're not, you're not jogging your head. <laughs> I think I, I think I follow Okay, you. cool. Good. So uh, yeah. Facebook trends, Google analytics data. I wanted to get goals in separately. GMB data, Google Ads, MailChimp. This is where we're getting our management fees. Um, I also had to deal with a cast issue where I didn't want to rebuild that source so you can always cast it again. You can cast it as a, instead of it being an integer, casting it as a float. Um, and um, Microsoft data their reporting client list, and then um, form data that was going into a separate Google Sheet that had um, monthly insights, which I'll show you on the visualization. We then build, in terms of how DBT recommends that you build stuff, they, they would say that you would probably put all of these queries, the Facebook, Trends, GA, GA Goals, GMB, ads, MailChimp, management, Microsoft, list, reporting wins. All of these should go inside the staging folder. Mm -hmm. And then anything that's like, um, that relates to business processes or um, 
I think the analysis, I, I couldn't quite wrap my head around that one piece, but like my final stuff should go into the marks folder. And these mm -hmm. are things that I manually built. Um, this is how you build folders, by the way, inside models, you would click new file. And then you could say like, um, Marts one. And for me to build a folder, I have to build a file in it. And you would give it a file name, whatever, sile.sql. Um, and it has to end in .sql uh, if it's going to be a model, i.e. a query. So you can't create an empty folder? You... Yeah, you can't build an empty folder. And I don't think you can drag and drop either. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out how to, how to drag and drop. I don't know why that isn't in place yet, but you know, they'll figure it out. Um, okay. Now here's the cool part. Watch how, how it all works. So I'm going to delete, I'm going to delete some tables here. Just so you can see it working. And these are my um, output ones, right? Mm -hmm. GA, delete, and I'll get rid of my GMB. They're easy to spell. And then think of this as the command line down here. And there are different flags that you can do. Like if I just want to run one of the models, mm -hmm. I could... I could say mo uh, dbt flag models and then use the model name, i.e. when I'm running dbt, it basically is deleting the old table, rebuilding or dropping the old table and rebuilding it on the fly. Um, for this case though, I do want to do dbt run, which is to run the whole thing because we deleted a bunch of tables, right? So I go dbt run, we then get to watch it going. You can see the logs as it's building all those tables on the fly. You can get details of it, of what's happening, how long it took. And it's going to take about a minute. So, so Noah, quick, quick question. Yeah. Um, why did you choose to delete and then rebuild the tables versus append? So I think that that's a different model type called incremental. Okay. Inside DBT's language, there are huh. different model types, uh, not model types, um, materializations, I think are table, view, incremental, another one called ephemeral. I think the incre incremental makes sense for what you're talking about, but I also felt like um you're dealing with like merging data and stuff like that with the incremental mm -hmm. and this method was very easy for me to execute all right so i think it's run all my tables now i can go back into face into a uh, big query this is my data set that they were all pushed to remember these are these were all the tables we deleted a whole bunch mm -hmm. now i expect to see um facebook rebuilt GA rebuilt and GMB rebuilt. Facebook, GA, GMB. And I might have deleted this one too before, I don't remember. But, and then we go into them and we can see data. That it built on the fly. And then, What's super baller is that this is what um, that reporting final looks like as a data source. Like all the fields that we're pulling in. Um, the month, ad spend plus management, which is like total cost. All goal completions, all paid. So it's like grabbing all the marketing channels together. All the, all the combined clicks, all the combined CPC, CTR, combined impressions, cost per lead, which aggregates it across all your channels, which is pretty cool. Cost per, ba per paid conversion, display, 
management fee data, Facebook data, form fills, which was a manually built uh, field inside your data source. Um, Google Ads and Microsoft. This is just to do on the paid side, combining those two channels. There are other ways to do this, by the way. I, I get all that. It's just I wanted to make it simpler. And what I liked about this was that, and I, I'm not done, like there's more iterations to go, but I assume that I can get this all down to one data source per client, which would be really a great way to build a report. Like you wouldn't have to pull in like a report per channel. You'd have to just pull in one. So I have all my goals. I got all 20 of my goals. I got my goal conversion rate more of those combined paid search ones of Google and Microsoft, um, Google paid, just search. So I got my search click. So I'm not worrying about filtering anymore. I'm doing all that filtering up in DBT cloud. Um, Microsoft and the filtering of course is what breaks our visualizations. You know, when you're dealing with blends and all mm -hmm. kinds of sheet stuff, it's like stuff gets broken all the time. Um, paid search, um, more form fields, total ads costs, and record count, which I would probably disable. But this is the real benefit as far as the way I see it. I mean, it's just everything is just crazy fast um, on the reporting side. I've already looked at these, so these are cached, but let's go to page, I think nine was the last one that you and I looked at. This is, I mean, that's pretty fast, don't you think? And like to get this stuff where you're doing combined impressions, where you're combining that for multiple different marketing channels, like that's hard to do. Combine clicks for multiple channels, total ads costs, combining them all. And then here's the, here's the big one is cost per conversion. How much is my leads? What are my leads cost? And that's hard to get, you know, compiling or aggregating all that together. Um, yeah, the speed thing is really neat to me because I'll be walking clients through data yeah. studio reports that are pulling from sheets sometimes and I'm like before the call frantically trying to click through every page to, to get it to start loading. Yeah. So th that, that's really cool. Did this walk through? Oh, there's a couple neat things on this report that I would show you guys because you probably hadn't thought of doing it this way in a data studio report. Um, Let's say you're going to be swapping out account managers. Oh, shoot. Well, I'm going to gray this page out when we, when we go live anyway. But what you can see is that their email address is uh, attached to different roles. Let's say someone leaves the company. You'll, you would have a way of having a Google sheet in the background. You know, like we have a reporting list uh, Google sheet where it has column A is client name, client, uh, column B is dig, you know, the D ma'am, client, uh, column B is the PPC person, you know, the next column is your content person or whatever, column D is content. And then there's also like another column for the, for the client logo, another column for uh, others, you know, there's other reasons to have it, but, I thought you would think this is neat. So it updates over time. You only have to maintain who's working on what in one place. And then you can also pull in a glossary, um, which is in that same thing. So let's say you want to change what CTR is or how you define it. You can just edit that in one Google sheet and then use that as, as a source for all of your different client reports. Um, and then the other thing that I think is pretty cool about how we built that particular solution is the use of a form. A lot of times people will use custom text. Um, they'll use um, a custom, custom, oh, come on now. What they will do is, oh shoot, I have to be in drive, don't I? Um, drive, okay, um, reporting, reporting insights. I think this is it. 
I'm going to have to just gray all this out when we do the live one. Mm -hmm. Can I see? Oh, preview. So this I think is pretty neat. You have a Google sheet that has all your clients in it and there's an app script easily available that I'll link in the presentation that allows you to do a pull down inside a Google form, which I think is pretty cool. And it updates as you add clients and remove them and it also alphabetizes them. Say what your role is on the team, what month you're reporting for, and you pick the first day of the month that you're reporting for. Then you add your insight. You can even add a screenshot. Um, and we weren't, e we weren't able to get keyword data from SEMrush in an easy way. So we determined that the time that was gonna be necessary to work with the API to get us a good answer was gonna be a shit show. So we kept this as a manual piece so they can enter their, the amount of keywords, the amount of keywords gained, how many review requests we sent out, how many requests were open, how many total third party reviews, because the review platform that they were using didn't have an API that was easy to work with and the total amount of feedback. Why are we doing this? And I'll explain because it was such a, it was so cool when we figured it out. So in Data Studio, of course you can have a text field that you type in, right? But the problem is in month two, when you go and you add those insights, all that data is gone and overwritten and there is no history of it. And so the benefit of this is it all pushes to a Google form excuse me, do a Google sheet. And because I'm putting my reporting month data in there, it's, it's gonna be something that I can filter with a date picker inside Data Studio. Mm -hmm. And that page looks like, like this. This doesn't have screenshots, but it just gives you an insight. And this is a neat little trick where you can use, um, you can rename your form field and make a new field and do regex replace. So it's looking for double dashes and then you can have it add a new line character and then double dashes or turn it into a mid dot if you wanted. I think I shared that with um, Lee earlier. And then this is what that review management page would look like. Hopefully there's data. Oh no, this client didn't have review management. But it would show you the last three months, you know, we sent out a whole bunch. These are the amount of requests we sent out, open third party reviews. So it looked like meaningful data if they actually had entered it. Um, pretty cool, right? Oh, yeah. here's another neat one. Lee, I don't know if you've done this. It drives me nuts that you can't have something <laughs> like Right. Just a, a form field where you can have a, a yeah, date values in a, in a chart, right. you know, a little, uh, what do you yeah. call it? Um, so I, I have a formula inside a Google sheet that's pulling in, you know, this month minus one and doing the same thing for the year. And it accounts for, you know, where, when I'm going from January back to December of the previous year, there's a formula that does that as well. Um, this normally would have the client logo. For mm -hmm. the purpose of this presentation, I got rid of that image just so you guys don't have to see their client logo. No, that's nice. Um, I'm not presenting this as fantastic typography or tamp like non-data pukey data visualization. The point is really right. just like, how do we get this whole beast to work together as a system? Lee, we've come so far. I know. Isn't that uh, awesome? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the um, couple, couple things that you may be interested in and that I noticed while we were going through this. Yeah. Um, you can put in multi-lines in Google Sheets. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think on your import though, I think there's a thing that says uh, use new lines or look for new lines um, or, or treat as new lines, something like that on your uh, uh, string input. So you wouldn't have to necessarily replace with a new line character, although you can. 
yeah. um, uh, which allows you then to, you know, so, you know, my uh, Google Data Studio Resource Center, yep. uh, those have line breaks in them now. And I do all my work through a form. So I just write up a paragraph and then write a next paragraph and format it there. Um, ever since I convinced Google Analytics to actually make line breaks, um, yeah. it works great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you can do that. I like the idea, though, of also, um, I think the one thing that it doesn't do really well is um, uh, special characters, yeah. which you kind of had there. And I'll bet you could even do crazy stuff like emojis. Yeah. Um, like replace this with a, you know, green triangle. I think I did that somewhere actually. Um, so yeah, so you can actually use uh, uh, kind of graphic characters. Yeah. If you wanted to. Um, so that's a possibility. Uh, yeah. Can you show me that um, uh, it was the report that you had all the people on? I think it was the thank you page or yeah. the page just before that one. I like the glossary idea, by the way. That That's a great – I hadn't thought about doing a glossary, and that, that just makes a lot of sense. Um, so that last part, like your circle – your energy circle management team? Yeah. Um, it's, so that's dynamic? No, that's hard-coded. That oh, one okay. second, those people are, are too legit to quit. They're not going to quit anytime soon. Don't <laughs> okay. say their names. Don't say their names. I, I got gotcha. you. Okay. Uh, I, I was just wondering because I was like, <laughs> okay. I was thinking instead of just the way you have your tables formatted for this, yeah. It kind of makes sense because for an, a particular account, you would have a certain account manager, a specialist, yeah. an associate. Yeah. Um, so you could have those as separate columns. Yep. Um, I was th you can either do it that way or you could do it by rows. Sure. And, and just add and put the uh, title as a, um, as a column. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So like account manager, this thing, that thing. Yeah, yeah, totally. Think all the way through. I mean, it could be structured the same exact way as the glossary. I mean, there's no reason not to do that. What I was dealing with was um, the other agency had typography that I was matching. And so uh, uh, I got gotcha. you. You know I got what I mean? You. Like, so they yeah. had a, a pre existing report through a different reporting tool. Wow. And I was just getting this to match that instead yeah. of otherwise, I probably would have done it just like something like this. Yeah. That's easy peasy. Yeah. Um, I had another idea for you. Uh, oh, and there is one thing. Was... Um, can I switch gears? Sure. Go ahead. I no, want to I... make sure I show you how to, how to run it on a monthly basis. The DBT part. Yeah. Cause that's like why it's so freaking cool. Um, you go into jobs, you make a job, give it a name, you tell it whether, what the environment's gonna be. You then um, have to set up how often it is, every day, specific days, custom schedule. And this is just using standard cron terminology. So it's like how many minutes of every hour on what day of the month do you want it to run? And, um, um, and once you set up the cron, it'll just run. You can also do webhooks, which I've not investigated yet. And I think the way that that works is if you're updating your repo inside GitHub or you push a pull request or whatever, it will automatically rerun again. Because if you basically fuck up the data somewhere with your formulas, and you go into GitHub to fix those formulas, it will it'll push the data again. Mm. And then if you're on the enterprise plan, um, which is a lot of money, I think, per month, then you can interact with the tool via the API. Mm. But I think this is pretty good for free. I mean, like, this doesn't oh, cost anything. Oh, yeah, it's really good for free. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> it's pretty damn hard to, to argue with it. So, um, I have to give major props to a whole bunch of people. Uh, one is Nico Brooks. He uh, 
he's he's one of the two principals at two octobers and by the time we publish this i think the news will probably be out um i'm i'm joining two octobers on april one and i'm incredibly stoked about it that's fantastic bring, yeah it's really really cool i'm joining them as a product director and cool. We're going to be um, bringing my bike shop SEO clients along with me, which is really exciting. Um, but Nico Brooks from Two Octobers, Jordan, you are the man. Lee, you are the man. I got to give <laughs> you props because you helped me at a number of stages when we built the Sheets version of that initial report. And as I was supporting that was the client, <laughs> that was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, but as, I remember, yeah. As I was like supporting them, they would come up with support requests like, why isn't this recognizing such and such as a date field, you know? And that was like, man, I fucking hate sheets. <laughs> like, I got to I gotta get this into BigQuery. I won't have to deal with any of these data type issues anymore. So anyway, you can set up a job for all your projects, right? So you can do client A, client B, client C, client D. You can also set up... Um, in DBT's terminology, there's there's different environments. There's dev for like, oh, I'm building this out or I'm deploying, i.e. this is live. So you can set up crons for both if you wanted. Name them different things. But um, also I want to give props to um, Coding is for Losers. David's amazing. Um, I'm going to be writing a blog article about how to do this for Coding is for Losers. Um, it's not exactly the same as how he runs his course. I'm not saying my way is better at all. I think it's hacky. Um, but I think it's neat to have alternate takes on technology. So um, I have to give him major props. And the, uh, the DBT team has fantastic documentation at uh, getdbt.com. Uh, and they also have an amazing Slack community. Um, and what I love especially is their, their beginners community. You can see there's over 4,000 people in the beginners community. And you can ask simple questions and you'll get a whole bunch of answers on the same day. I don't understand how projects work. I don't understand the difference between a project and an environment. Can you help me understand that? And uh, people jump right in. Um, and the thing that's cool about that is that reporting is like intellectual property, right? And you'll see people say, hey, does anybody have a well-structured project that they want to share? And those don't seem to get answered because that's like basically, <laughs> hey, can you build my reporting toolkit and share with me? You know, but uh, yeah, so, so there's definitely smarter, better ways to do all of the stuff that I showed you. This was really just to present one hacky way of doing it for someone going from sheets to BigQuery, who's not like a BigQuery. I'm not like a big SQL guy. I did figure all this out, but it's not like I'm really good at it. I'm sure that could be more performant and smarter. But. Okay, more thoughts or questions? Uh, you and me both. No, at least, it, like you said, it's great to see different ways to do things. Sometimes different mental models, you know, work out yeah. and your, your model's really clear. Yeah. So uh, like you said, there may be a more efficient way to do it, but yeah. at least I'd rather have clarity. You can always optimize clarity, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so starting there is a good point. So somebody can pick this up much easier uh, than some models and, you know, kind of run with that. Um, so no, I think it's great. Um, I have, well, I was just curious about a couple of things. One is, uh, you're pulling everything basically into a reporting table, right? Yeah. Um, so you're not really, and my understanding with BigQuery is you're only paying for pulling data out. Correct. And you're not paying, for, I don't think you pay for visualization. And you also get a terabyte of queries a month, right. which is a ton. Right. Yeah. I mean, for, for what you're doing there, um, uh, because you're basically going by day. Is that correct? Uh, month. And check out. Oh, you're going by month. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
watch how much data this queries. Oh yeah. Select, select all from, um, let's see, I want to go um, cam, whoops. And you can go cam solar. Oh, that's nice, yeah. Reporting final, where month is not null, just cause. And it'll tell you this, this query would have cost 14.5 kilobytes. And right. that's just because there's a lot of columns. It's really right, 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 right. Yeah. So I had um, a couple uh, just ideas. Yeah. For you. Yeah. Um, one. Of the, so that's cool. No, no, no worries there. Um, that's all good. You could conceivably connect that table back out to a sheet and report off of that. Yep. So you wouldn't have any. <laughs> or, or very little uh, <laughs> actual query stuff because you would be querying against um, the sheet as opposed to the um, as opposed to the report. That's one one idea there. Um, the other what's thing, the benefit of that? I don't get the benefit when you're making when you're making Data Studio calls. Then you're not constantly calling against the uh, BigQuery. Oh. Right, so when you draw a new chart, you're basically doing a different query. Yeah. Okay, so you're constantly calling it. So if you dump all the data into a sheet, then you're gonna be querying the sheet and you're not incurring, you're only incurring the one cost for the one call. Yeah. Update that sheet. Yeah. Um, the other possible way to do that is use um, the data extract connector. Yeah. If you've got some, which actually uses BigQuery in the background, but you don't get charged for it, huh. which is, uh, and, and sometimes they'll use the BI engine and it'll go really wicked fast. Yeah. So that that's another possible way to um, kind of, uh, I mean, you're not coming anywhere near your your <laughs> uh, costs or anything. And, and for the amount of work that it's doing, it's worth paying for some, but yeah. um, just, just some things that you might want to look at. And the last thing I would suggest when you're pulling your stuff in, you could actually pull all of your clients' data into a single table, like all of it, all of it, all of it. Yeah. And then as long as you had a client code on each row, you could you reuse the same report. Yep. So Because you can now... Yeah, you, you just filter. Could, Yes, you can do the filtering, right? So yep. you can pile everybody's data all together and then create a instead of creating a report for this, report for that, report for that person, report for that person, have a standardized, basically a single report. Yep. And when you send it to them, all you're doing is basically encoding it for their um, organization. So Jordan, I'm looking at your forehead and this is, <laughs> this is, what I'm what I'm hearing is you have 50 clients, you have 50 final reports in BigQuery, you have another table that queries all of those and joins it into one table, and as it does that join, it adds a client number as a new field in each, you know, it's a new column, last, first, whatever, and then you have one report, which is the master template, and on each page you filter by client. Yep. Yeah, and you don't even have to create a new. Uh, you don't even have to create a new filter. Yeah. Um, you can put that in as a hidden field, basically now. So you uh, can. Yeah. Uh, so you can pass a parameter in. So you, you give. That? So you give them the URL with their special code in it. Yeah. That yeah. special code is basically the uh, dimension value. Um. So. If you're like Ford F150, yeah. when I give you your URL, it has Ford F150 encoded in it. And when you pull up the report, it only shows your data. Hmm. How do you set right? that? I mean, <laughs> I'm hearing there's view owner's data versus view the user's data. That's how you've shown me how to do stuff like that in the past. How do you do the filter? How do you... Put the filter in the URL. So that's the magic. That's that's the magic. Um, 
I've, I've been working on one uh, on my own connector actually to do oh. some stuff like this, but no, no, yeah. no, it's standard now. Yeah. Um, it's standard. You can either filter by email address. Yes, so if yes. you send this to somebody and you have the email encoded, like that would be one way to do it is to have the email encoded yeah. in a column. And yeah. then only that person, only people who have that email address, you can then put in which email addresses are, are okay to yes. view and they only view their own data. Huh. That's one way to do it. Now the second way is um, a minor hack. Um, so think about it this way. If you did all these reports, right, but you put a master uh, filter on the top for client. Yeah. Right? Okay. Now, if you could set that to single select, so it would filter the entire report for a single client, right? And you can set bookmarks, right, on your... Um, I don't know if you've used bookmarks. So if you do a bunch of filters and then you send somebody the URL, it actually encodes the values for the filters in the URL. Oh, okay. <laughs> so if you have the company and you do, all you have to do is uh, do this once you do a drop down filter with a single select. You look at the URL <laughs> that'll have the company code in it. And then all you have to do is, when you, um, that basically sets the single value to filter the entire report by the customer, right? And you can, so you'll be able to, yeah, exactly. So you'll be able to see that in the URL. You send the link to your customer. It's going to filter by that customer URL. So you only need one report. Huh. So, um, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? The guy in Canada. Um, we, we were working on this for education stuff. Me and uh, Pablo in uh, Spain. This is, I don't know, a year ago or so. And then, um, oh God, what is his name? I can't remember his name. Is it Michael Howlesley, who was from South of South Africa? Oh, my God. No, 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 no. We were working on other stuff. Uh, no, Pablo was the guy I was working with. But um, there's another guy. I can't remember his name. I'll find it. But um, in Canada and he solved some of the problems that we were looking at. Um, we knew that we could do a filter by, um, we knew that we could do a filter by doing a single select on a filter and having like a default or, or putting that in the URL. So that works fine. The problem was um, there were two stupid issues. We didn't know, we were like, oh man, but then you have this drop down that somebody can get to and I can't remember the keystrokes, but there is a way to get to anything, even if it's hidden on yeah. a report, right? Yeah. So you don't want to expose that yeah. uh, because then somebody could switch to a different client. Uh, but one of the ways to do that is you just move it off screen. Uh. <laughs> it's like, and then they can't do it. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I know. Um, but what, so once you have that um, selector, though, it, now, it will generate a, um, a code in your URL. Yes. And then you can just replace that code in the URL for a different client. And boom, all their stuff will fill in. Assuming you've got the client code on every row. Um, okay. Right? So yeah. you could have 150 clients, and, and like you said, BigQuery doesn't care um, how, much, how much data it has in there. So you can put a ton of data in there. Also, when you're doing the query, it's going to filter for that. Uh, since it's a global one on the entire report, I believe yeah, it'll yeah. filter for that one customer anyhow. So there's, I mean, I hear everything. So there's some saying, possibilities uh, there. <laughs> yeah, you just got the wheels turning as per usual. So um, I guess I'm trying to figure out how I'd filter, because in this specific case, my management fees are filtering by client, that mm -hmm. table, mm -hmm. and my reporting client list is filtering by client. And then I have my reporting final table, which you're recommending, not recommending, but you're saying is possible to aggregate yep. across all the clients. Yep. How would I get filters for three separate things into the URL? Or would I make them the same? Like I'd No, you'd have to have the same key. Okay. And it would you need could, one key for your client for each client. But could that one key apply to three different data sources? 
Could that be a field in each of the data sources? Sure. Okay. All right. Yeah. Like, so that first part where you were pulling from sheets? Yeah. In, either you could hard code a, a client field in there, mm -hmm. right? Or as you pull it in, you could look for the URL mm -hmm. and do a case switch or something like that there. Or use the URL, the base URL from, uh, uh, whatever you're pulling in for the, for the, or pull the company name from the GMB or somewhere. Um, let's see. So wh wherever it's coming from, as long as you can add that uh, customer ID onto all your tables that you're pulling together. Mm -hmm. Got it. Wow. That's pretty sick. It's so you got the wheels turning a little bit. So, <laughs> The only thing about your solution, so I like what you're saying a lot. I guess what I have a little bit of a hard time with is how does that account for situations when you're adding and removing clients? I, I'd have to think through that. That's the part where where I'd have to come up with. Well, you're just adding more rows to the table, so yeah, for your, to your final table, or you're going to regenerate your table when you lose a client. Um, you could probably do a view. You could probably just make a view, pull, pull all your final tables together into a big view. Yeah. And it would just generate it that way. Mm. Um, but yeah, so, th so that's a, that's a model now though. That's an actual model. Um, like I said, you can even protect with uh, email. Yep. If you put an email on there or like a Gmail account, if, if you go that way, it'll actually, uh, if you put somebody's Gmail on there, it'll actually check to see if that, the person that's accessing the report has that Gmail and will then show them the data mm. or that that's attached to that Gmail. Mm -hmm. um, but I like the code thing better. It's, um, you can come up with a, um, you know, you can make a single table that says, okay, uh, if one of your customers is Ford, you come up with some crazy, crazy ass string for Ford. So you can set up another sheet that does the cross reference between the company name and the, yeah. the, um, and the code. Yeah. So that nobody can break the code on the URL that way. Yeah. They can't just put in a customer name. Huh. So have you seen all this stuff or did you actually learn something with this process? I figured you'd get a kick out of it at a minimum. Me? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I haven't, I haven't played with BigQuery that much. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, it really helps me to see you working with the different tools. Yeah. Uh, and like you said, there were a couple of gotchas there that I would probably be banging my head against for a few hours too. So I really appreciate that. That. Uh, and if this tool is free, uh, it definitely looks like something to play with. Yeah, for sure. And uh, the community is crazy supportive. They also have a lot of tutorial videos and tutorial projects. And uh, I feel like I watched videos for two to three months and I built the whole thing last weekend. Like, <laughs> like it, and the way that it worked was I had that, that one sheet. I had, um, I had this final, right? Yep. And it has lots and lots of data. And then yep. I worked backwards from here and I matched all of the formulas that were in my sh Google sheet and learned how to turn those Google sheet formulas into SQL. And when I started, all I understood how to do was select all. I knew select star. Hey, no, that's great. I mean, that's, that's, uh, so you went through and you basically built it up kind of like the pyramids. I mean, start yeah. off with blocks on the lower level. Yeah. Keep building up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and build up your complexity because there's no way to get to this final table without all the pieces. Yeah. And what I, so what's funny is I didn't understand that I had to build it like the pyramids. I was like, Oh, this was is this easy. together. Yeah. yeah. I just joined everything. I was like, none of this makes sense. What? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can, but, uh, it's really, it, I wouldn't, uh, just after years of experience, 
you want to go down to the lower level. So like you said, you can sanity check each step. Yeah. Right. Cause if you get a piece of bad data in there, yes. um, that's not accounted for <laughs> like a string in your, somebody puts a Y in your number column. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, then it, you know, it's possible for things to go all out of whack. So it really helps to be able to, to build those lower pieces first as yeah. kind of a unit test and then, and then build up. Yep. And then once you're up at that l upper level and you've got everything done, then you can kind of go nuts. Yeah. And definitely like this took me, this big query took me probably, I don't know how long it took me to learn how to build it. I probably spent 20 hours trying to learn how to do it. Once I understood how to, how to query, a qu how to query a subquery or whatever, I was like, oh my God, I can treat all these subqueries like it's a table and I just have to refer to them by that query name. Oh my God. That, that was the breakthrough. Um, but anyway. Yes, well, you're ahead of me then because uh, I, I yes. hack at SQL. No, no, no. Uh, and I, 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 when I get SQL, I hack at it and I like figure it out and I can do it. But yeah, I, yeah. I rarely do anything from scratch. So. Um, yeah, no, my hat's off to you there. And that's a great learning. That's, that's a really good learning process there too. Yep. I think so too. Okay. That is great. This well, has been you. an amazing agency automators. It was more of a hangout than we've done in a long time. Hooray. Yeah. Um, are there any other cool hacks or tricks you want to share Lee? Cause I could turn this into a, a quick, like a two to five minute little thing. I can cut it and, and make an, a fun one. Oh, no. Um, I was just going to suggest um, uh, the other guy who's out there, uh, Mehdi. Yeah. Uh, okay. So yeah, M-E-H-D-I. Yeah. Yeah. He's got some really good, um, like where you had that little hack with the um, date on there. Yeah. He's got some stuff uh, for... Um, you know, like documenting your interface and stuff like that, that you might want to check out for like pulling stuff out of other tables and stuff. So he's some, he's got some really good, um, he's got some really good posts on that. And One sometimes, has, he's, sometimes he's a little bit advanced and it's like, oh, you got to read it twice. And it's yeah. like, wait, what did he do? He's a really, really clever guy. Uh, yeah, yeah. So some of his stuff, um, is worth uh, taking a look at. Just some of his little tricks um, are uh, definitely some pretty cool things. I'll have to send you the um, the whole idea about the uh, you know using one uh, report for all your clients. Uh, yeah. Somebody did that for um, God. I can't remember. Stephanie. Stephanie. Uh, I can't remember. Stephanie something French. <laughs> That's cool. up, in, up in Quebec. Yeah. And oh, he's the guy who does, um, um, uh, what is it? Uh, the tool, the plugin tools, um, for oh. analytics. Oh, very um, cool. Da Vinci tools. Oh yeah. Uh, Stephanie Hamill. That's it. Stephanie Hamill. So he came up with this, like I said, I was hacking at it with this other guy in Spain for a while and we kind of figured out to, how to do it, but we, we put it on the back burner and then he put out this great post that was like, Hey, do you need to report for 800 clients <laughs> with one report? Here's how to do it. Wow. Uh, and since then they've added more, um, they've added more features that make it a little bit easier, but he figured out, he, he found those other things independently from us. But I was like, I, I was just uh, half disgusted that I didn't think of those. Some of the, I'm like, oh, of course. Why didn't I think of that? Because we were banging our heads for like uh, weeks. How can we, we were making like graphs that would cover the screen, you know, and uh, all sorts of, you know, just wacky things. And yeah. um, just, just one or two things that he had in there were yeah. uh, really amazing. Um, him and pa Pablo figured out a lot of those things too. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, he uses it in the education area. 
so that you can do like student reporting because you don't want one student to see another student's stuff. Yeah. So each student can have their own ID. You don't have to make a separate report for each student. They can all use the same report. They just go in with their ID and done that way. Very cool. One last thing I wanted to show you because I think you'll go, oh, you're, this will make your developer heartstrings strum or whatever the horrible analogy is. Um, when you run that automation, you can set it up to create docs on the fly. Nice. And it builds the documentation for every one of your models, telling you what all the columns are, yeah. the date type, and the SQL. In your in your query, oh okay, both in the DBT language and in the compiled, what's actually happening on the BigQuery nice. side? Oh, nice. Uh, I forgot to show you that before. Very nice. No, Very I cool. like the way you got that stuff parameterized. That was really cool too. I mean, that's that's a really powerful thing. I so. Yeah, I was like, I was like, ooh, holy baller. That means yeah, I can spin yeah, up a yeah. new project and just change the config. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's great. Okay. Thanks. You guys rock. Awesome. Thank you. You you rock. Hey, hey in there. How's everybody doing? By the way, in their little. Oh, um, I'm gonna stop recording. Let's keep chatting.